Hi, everyone. Um, I see we already have 115 participants, so I'd like to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. And on behalf of the organizers of the event, EdTech Hub, UNHCR, and Learning Equality, thank you for joining us for today's really important discussion. And we're also joined by a stellar group of subject matter experts um, who will be providing more clarity on the nitty gritties of digital curriculum alignment process. So uh, moving on to the agenda for, day, for today, today's 90 minute session, uh, we'll start off with some housekeeping items and a quick few introductions, and then we'll move on to scene setting and why this topic is so important and what brings us all here today. So more than 250 people have signed up for today's event and we're a bit cognizant of the limitations of the Zoom webinar um, format. And so we'll be providing some um, additional or alternative spaces for active engagement. And we hope that you'll use them uh, to, to their fullest. So let's start off with Inquire. So um, as you might be familiar with, uh, Zoom has a Q&A question box. So please do pop your questions in there. It helps us to organize the questions and it'll also be useful to use the thumbs up button uh, to upvote any particular questions. We'll also be using this to guide our Q&A session uh, towards the end of the event today. Next is Reflect. So um, we'll be posting a link to Menti in the chat. And as the discussion progresses, please do drop your thoughts and reflections into Menti. So we have left the Zoom chat open, uh, but we'd like to use this for light introductions uh, but, and sort of request that you put those juicy thoughts and those deep insights into Menti where, where we can properly capture them and also respond to them. And lastly, uh, please um, contribute so you can share your, your thoughts. Um, we'll be doing a Zoom poll in a bit, but also if you'd like to take the conversation further and engage on social media, you can use the hashtag design to align. So let's kick off with a poll to get to know you. So um, a poll should be appearing on your Zoom page right now. And we ask you to share who you are and um, your experiences of curriculum alignment. So I'll give you a minute to um, pop in your answers for this. So the two questions again are, who are you? How would you classify your role as an education stakeholder and your experience, how you, part, how you supported the process of curriculum, curriculum alignment in the past? Great, okay. So it looks like we have a diverse group here um, with educators as, as the most uh, prominent educator. And okay, and also quite a diversity in terms of experiences with curriculum alignment. Um, I see there's only 1% that's responded to the, huh, what's curriculum alignment? So I'm glad uh, we have a, most people understand uh, what cu curriculum alignment is vaguely. Okay, so um, now that we've gotten to know a bit about you, we'd like to share a bit more about the, about the organizers and why we've come together today. So learning equality. Learning equality specifically supports half of the world's, uh, half of the world that does not have access to the internet through its open source product suite, Colibri, designed for offline first teaching and learning. And it has developed a tool for curriculum alignment and engages in advocacy efforts to make alignment of digital resources possible. Then we're also joined by our UNHCR colleagues from uh, the education section, who as part of their efforts to ensure refugees are included in national education systems, identify that there's a strong need for digital content to be aligned and cleared against natural curricular standards. 
So uh, UNHCR's Connected Education Program works to support ministries to implement ed tech in interventions to ensure that refugees and host communities uh, are not only digitally included, but also have meaningful access to right, the right resources to enhance uh, the quality of their learning. And lastly, I work with the EdTech Hub, an organization aimed at empowering people through giving them the evidence that they need to make decisions about technology and education. And as we work with and we support ministries of education, digitizing resources and curriculum alignment, particularly during the COVID-19 period, um, has been of great interest. And there's a lot of opportunities to fill the gaps of knowledge around these concepts. So, um, I'll now hand over to Rebecca, from UN, uh, who is the UNHCR's Chief of Education, to do some scene setting. Thank you. Over to you, Rebecca. Super. Thank you so much. I mean, first of all, I just want to, to echo Tuskeen's point and thank you so much for your participation. Um, I think curricular alignment has been increasingly kind of a part of conversations that we've been having and under the COVID-19 experiences, it's been something which is even more relevant and topical um, and very much you know, on people's minds. So it's an exciting moment and it's great to have all of you in the room. Um, I think we've seen this past year how national responses in particular have shifted um, and been looking towards supplemental digital resources. Uh, it's clear that supporting continuous learning opportunities while schools are closed has been really important, um, but also that children using those kind of materials need to have them embedded in the work they were doing before, and parents and teachers need to be clear that those digital resources are also really part of a wider learning package in terms of preparing for a return to school and working with some kind of familiar content. For UNHCR, this is something that we've been working on for, for really quite some time. Um, we've been investing in connected education and building digital uh, investments in schools for many years. And through this work and our exchanges with teachers all around the globe, the need for aligned digital resources has become abundantly clear. Caregivers, teachers and students have all, I think, been struggling to find their way in the myriad of education resources available. Um, and actually, I think for lots of parents during this last year, uh, when faced with homeschooling their own children and having to kind of work their way through what was there, what was supplementary, what was linked to the curriculum, what their school required. Um, it's also become a lot more apparent to more people the challenges involved uh, in really navigating what's out there and understanding how to use it directly with and for children. But in the low resource environments where UNHCR is working, the challenge is compounded by the time limit that teachers have to prepare lessons uh, and also sometimes by the, the capacity of some teachers. Um, I mean, the, the title that we started on was about making things more painless. And in my own work and research um, in Dadaab camp in Kenya, for example, I found that teachers were so enthusiastic and excited to use digital tools. They recognized the value of them, but just struggled so much to navigate them, to work out how to find things, how to use them, and how to really ensure that they were in line with what they felt they had signed up to in terms of delivering a national curriculum and teaching what parents and students wanted to, to be having access to. So these kind of findings and this important point around teaching parents' needs as well really led us to our partnership with Learning Equality, which started in 2015. And I think since then we've been on this really exciting learning journey, actually. I mean, finding ways to streamline digital content alignment, um, working with a range of national authorities and the different parts of governments that work on curriculum processes, and also with curricular experts um, and educators. And we've had sectoral experts, for example, and the bright minds at Google, um, helping us think through how to automate some parts of this process. I mean, I think UNHCR has learned a huge amount um, in those partnerships. And I think it's been really rewarding to see some of the recognition from education leaders around the globe really getting to recognize that alignment to national curricula is a vital aspect in terms of meaningful digital access. We also recognize the critical role that the EdTech Hub has taken to support ministries of education, for example, um, and looking at understanding the value of curriculum alignment, you know, why is it important, but then how do we do it as well, particularly during COVID. Uh, and I think it's, it's really exciting to see their support of this important work. I think often the, the notion of alignment can be skewed and a bit misunderstood. Um, and I'm sure in the conversation today, that would be one of the, the key topics in terms of, you know, what is, what is alignment? What's having things which are relevant, but what does real alignment mean? And it's important to then break it down and have it so it's, it's clearly understood um, in a way 
that makes content impactful for students, for educators and the sector and makes the processes clear um, so that we as partners can work together. So this is why we're really excited to co-host this webinar um, and share some of our experience, but also allow you to hear firsthand from curricular experts who've gone through the process themselves and to start to outline some of the steps and some of the challenges of this work. Um, so we recognize, you know, it's an element that's going to continue to grow in importance. Uh, I believe and, and hope and I think in terms of streamlining processes so they're well understood um, and so they're easier hopefully to, to replicate and scale and so we see this meeting as a really important first step. Thank you so much. Thank you very much Rebecca. Um, my name is Shivi Chandra and I'm uh, the curriculum lead at Learning Equality. Um, before we dive into the substance of what our panelists have to share with you today, um, we just wanted to provide an understanding, a common understanding from our side about what curriculum alignment means for the purposes of this discussion and the way that we approach it. So it's quite simple for us. We consider curriculum aligned resources to be a digital library of multimedia learning objects. So OER repositories, content that people have created, anything like that, matched to a set of clearly defined learner needs and conditions, which in our case is coming from the official standards of the national education curricula, um, but can also come from um, programs, own requirements, certification needs, things like that. And that all of this is shared via a digital platform which shares the approved content in a way that's familiar to the end users and the teachers who will be using it. So these three components constitute a curricular aligned system. And we find um, in the next slide that curriculum alignment is kind of a prerequisite for any structural digital intervention when you look at it this way. We have here um, a lot of different trends that we've seen in the learning space in the past, um, in the past year, especially as a response to COVID-19 and other remote learning challenges, um, personalized learning systems, national hubs, digital resource repositories, credentials, AI-based recommendations, learning pathways, and curriculum alignment really undergirds all of these things because it's what systematically asking the question, what should be included to teach this subject matter? In what order? And is it successful and meeting the requirements that teachers themselves have um, for proceeding with their work? Going on, when we were um, kind of talking amongst ourselves within this collaboration, we found that a lot of our questions about digital education were coming back to the question, when we recommend best practices for blended learning, whether it's on a stakeholder level, an institutional level, um, teacher training, new content creation, practices dealing with the management of OER, are these actually realistic in how much time they ask of implementers and educators? And the answer that we came to as a group is that if materials are already aligned at the stage before they get to educators, then educators can spend their limited planning time on the more creative, personalized, and adaptive instruction and pedagogy that we want to emphasize as a space rather than the tedious process of checking materials for curriculum compliance. So as a group, um, the approach that we take falls into two sort of buckets of work in curriculum alignment, which feed upon each other. Um, the first one, and the one which we'll be focusing on primarily today, is the expert enablement approach. So we fund and support subject matter experts who know the country teaching environments we're working within um, and curricular bodies to match materials to learning objectives and then share through specialized tools, for example, Learning Equality's Colibri Studio tool. And then the other approach is the semi-automated approach where we use data from these alignment efforts to build and train AI-based tools to suggest better search results. So not just based on a sort of a keyword search, but based on these experts' actual judgments of educational relevance. And these two things really feed upon each other um, as we see them. So we'll be hearing primarily from um, that first approach today with our panelists. And today you'll be hearing about projects um, in these five countries, Honduras, Jordan, Ghana, Kenya, and Chile, making use of over 20 different popular sources of open educational resources in English, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, our curriculum consultants really worked hard um, to arrange these materials and align them in a way that wasn't intended to replace official textbooks, but rather digital learning is supplementary and it's going to be used alongside and support the official materials in different types of remote learning schemes, remediation, national learning sites, and learning platforms so that teachers don't have to make um, a choice between trying out new types of digital content and following the educational requirements of their classrooms in the contexts where they work. 
So diving right into the process, um, we have six steps which we think that apply pretty generally to curriculum alignment as it takes place around the world in a variety of different contexts. Um, and we're really curious to hear from you. Um, based on the six steps that you see here, are there any that you're already familiar with? So you should see another poll momentarily, which will come up. And we'll give you a bit of time to answer this question. Do any of these processes look familiar to you? Have you engaged in them before? We're eager to hear. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and it looks like the, the majority of you have worked with at least one step of this process envisioning the possible um, pedagogical uses. Um, and few of you have worked on the part about sharing and iterating what has been done with alignment. So we're really excited to dive deeper into this process um, and hopefully elaborate more on all of it for you. Each of the panelists that um, you'll be listen, um, hearing from today has worked on every step of this process, but we asked each of them to speak about a particular stage in the process where they faced interesting and unique challenges and had unique solutions. Um, we also wanted to note that um, our colleague Joseph, who was working on the national curriculum in Ghana, is not able to join us today. Um, he was intended to speak about um, the second stage, vetting for relevance and appropriateness, but he's shared his thoughts in an interview, which we'll be um, sharing as well uh, in the, in the follow-up to the webinar. So moving to our first speaker. Um, we're going to be discussing the process of selecting and formatting standards, preparing them for curriculum alignment. Um, speaking on this topic will be Maxie Gluckman, who's the founder and director of Train for Change. She has um, over 10 years of education development experience, and um, her work in Honduras on teacher training in particular has been really critical to setting up the Honduran curriculum within the context of this project. So Maxie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I want to note that I am specifically speaking on behalf of a team that um, worked together on this. We had a group of 10 educators and teacher developers in Honduras who collaborated on this alignment. So I'm going to speak about the process of where do we start. We, the important point that we had to consider in terms of alignment efforts at the beginning was where do we start in terms of what are we aligning to? And so we actually spent quite a chunk of time on this as a team looking at what were the uh, publicly available um, standards from the national government and what was it that actually was being used in the classroom to determine where we would begin this alignment effort. So as you can see in the table here, we created um, a little bit of a timeline for ourselves in terms of when each of these resources had been last updated. And so we had the um, Curriculum Nacional Básico, the national curriculum, which those standards, which serve as a base for a lot of what is done in Honduran education, was last updated in 2003. However, there are sets of standards and um, program alignment that outlines what teachers should be teaching during certain points of the year that had been updated as recently as 2015. However, in conversation with educators that we were working with, they mentioned that the really most up-to-date resource that educators have in their classroom are these official Honduran textbooks. And those had been created and last updated in 2018. And so we made the choice that we wanted to determine what was going to be most of use and directly aligned to what's being used on the ground. And that's how that choice was made. Next slide. So we opted for the official Honduran textbook, and this is just a screen capture of one of those pages. The way that the Honduran textbook is laid out is that in each of, it's organized into four main chunks or blocks. 
that um, outline each of the grades. And we were doing natural sciences for fourth to ninth grade. And those might be a little bit different across grade categories, especially for primary versus secondary. But what they each have at the beginning of these blocks are these expectativas de logro or objectives or learning objectives. And so we determined that the best approach would be to align the resources in the content library to what these end users, being the students or teachers, were going to be using on the ground. And while it is the case that not all educators in Honduras do have access to these most updated books, sometimes they uh, also have to have them shared between students, what we did benefit from is that there is uh, one resource in the Colibri Content Library which actually has all of the Honduran textbooks uploaded in this most uh, updated format called the CREA channel. So we determined that that was going to be the best set of resources to align to. Next slide. So the process that we took in doing so is we pulled out all of these learning standards with the objective from each of these curricular blocks in the book. And while there was some alignment that could be made between those and the official standards, there also was uh, some areas where they didn't necessarily match up. So we used this as our principal aligning um, feature. And then we took those learning standards and aligned them to the content sourced in the Colibri library as, uh, as individual items. So we would name the channel and then we would name put the link and the name of the particular learning object that we were matching to that. And so as we went through the different content library, we matched many different resources to the same um, learning objective or learning standard. We then went through a process of re review criteria where as a team, we discussed what it meant to have a low, a medium or a high alignment in different areas, including how strong was it matched to the grade level in terms of level of difficulty, um, also the quality of the content, the vocabulary, and how relevant would it be in the Honduran context. And a really important piece of it was this need for internet as we were trying to really think of rural schools or communities where they would not have access to any internet to make sure that that wouldn't impede the ability for students to use some of the resources that were available. And then as many of the resources might have included some English or some other languages, we also noted that as well. Next slide. From there, we dove in and um, noted any potential potential modifications that we would wanna recommend if we were to be able to go in and make any of those moving forward in terms of content, in terms of the title of the learning object to make sure that it was very clear what it was that was going to be um, addressed in that section. And then we also included notes for teachers. So we called these the notas pedagogicas or pedagogical notes. And we included them in the description of each learning object so that as a teacher, as they are reviewing it, could make the decision um, to think about ways of expanding or going deeper or to, we included examples of potential evaluations that they could use. And so that note is really for the teacher to be able to reflect on how this might be used in their classroom. Next slide. And we went through a process as a team, uh, multiple iterations of revision and feedback. And this was all happening via Zoom due to uh, health and safety guidelines in Honduras and because of this international collaboration. And so we engaged in various um, moments of revision and feedback, both synchronously through meetings, as well as asynchronously commenting and using Google uh, Docs and Google uh, Slides and et cetera in order to provide that feedback. Next slide. And pulling it all together, we were able to produce the completed uh, aligned channel for grades four through nine um, in natural sciences. And we are now in collaboration with other local NGOs to plan a prospective pilot with rural schools to implement these collections and to determine their effectiveness at meeting educational continuity needs in the general context. Last slide. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and to share information with you.
Thank you very much, Maxie. Um, next, we'll be moving on to the second step of our process. And sharing this with us is Dr. Mania Mubaslet um, from the Madrasati Initiative, which supported the Jordanian government in um, aligning a set of materials in Arabic to the official curriculum. And these materials are now available um, on Colibri. So she has a great deal of experience with vetting for relevance and appropriateness, with, which is what she'll be speaking about today. Over to you, Dr. Mania. Um, hello, everybody. Um, nice to meet you uh, all. Um, actually, I'm going to share our experience as Madrasati Initiative in fitting the appropriateness and relevance of an educational content. We uh, in Madrasati uh, acted as the focal point uh, for curriculum mapping for UNHCR Jordan uh, Country Office and the Ministry of Education in Jordan. Um, Madrasati closely uh, coordinated all of its activities with the Ministry of Education and lays with key contacts within the uh, MOE. Um, Madrasati formed a digital curriculum consulting committee uh, comprised of MOE uh, subject matter experts from the curriculum department. And uh, this committee was uh, trained to map uh, the synergies of Colibri digital content to the Jordanian national curriculum outcomes, uh, specifically for math, science, English, and ICT, and for the grade seven to 12, with a specific focus on STEM. Uh, Madrasati supervised the uh, mapping process and uh, regularly reviewed the mapping documents for quality assurance. And at the same time, Madrasati designed a unique approach in aligning a Colibri digital content with the Jordanian uh, learning outcomes by organizing a workshop for the committee members to clarify the mapping procedures and to introduce the features of Colibri platform and Colibri studio in order uh, to know how to map the electronic content within the national outcomes. Madrasati developed a guideline uh, with uh, clear tips to support the committee and provided follow-up and support to the members of the committee uh, on a continuous basis. Uh, and this uh, was done through weekly visits to the curricula and textbooks administration. And through these visits, we mo uh, monitored the quality of the mapping procedure to inform the evaluation of the project outcomes. And also this included uh, conducting feedback sessions with the committee members in order to introduce any required uh, amendment. Uh, and uh, since we established a well-experienced committee from subject matter expert uh, from the Ministry of Education, this had facilitated the alignment and mapping procedures in terms of assuring the relevance and appropriateness of Colibri content. Uh, and they assured that the learning uh, experiences within uh, Colibri content are, di are directly uh, applicable to the um, MOE standards and the cultural experience of the students. And here we talk about personal experience and personal relevance, or uh, if the content is connected in some way to real world issues, problems, and context. And here we talk about life relevance. For example, uh, the committee is totally aware that any content which may address a political or religious issues is not acceptable. Even the used language and terminologies could be questioned if they are not standard Arabic, as the content could be in Arabic, but uh, in a different dialect, which will not be easy for all the students to understand uh, certain dialects, even if the content is in Arabic language. Uh, also, the committee assured that the educational and scientific used terminologies are up, uh, up to date, as we all know that some scientific terminologies uh, are outdated. 
Additionally, uh, we will uh, be modeling and testing this approach with teachers inside uh, four schools, and we equipped these schools with multi-purpose rooms, and we trained them on a blended learning approach and on personalized learning. And this will also allow us to examine the uh, process firsthand and identify the areas of improvements and cultural alignment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mania. Um, speaking next about the process of matching to the right topic and to learning outcomes in particular, um, we'd like to invite Werner Westerman. Um, he works with the Library of Congress Chile, and he has over 20 years of experience with ICT-enabled um, trainings, technologies, um, working in Chile as well as elsewhere. And he's also a staunch OER researcher and advocate. So Werner, we're very here, um, keen to hear from your perspective. Hello to everyone. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and, and to be in this uh, such powerful uh, discussion. Let me my chronometer. So um, I, first of all, I wanted to recall a, a very interesting topic related to, to reuse. Um, and this happened when just the, the, the term of OER was just being created. Uh, back then, back in 2002, David Wiley, one of, one of the founders of the OER movement, uh, talked about this reusability paradox where you had this tension between modularization, you know, chopping the content in little pieces with intention with this uh, idea of trying to create and integrate those small pieces. And you have this tension what, where you had constant trade-offs um, related to chopping the content so it can be really relevant and meaningful to a specific learning outcome, you know, giving more context. But if you wanted to integrate that, those little pieces, you kind of lose that, that context, that specific content where they, it can be relevant. The same thing happens with the reusability because if you chop to a small, piece of, uh, of content, it can be less reusable than, than a, a bigger one, than an, an integrated one. But if, if it's more reusable, you, you kind of lose impact if it's not uh, tied to, to, to the specific content. So, and that also led you to, you couldn't scale that, that solution because, you know, each content is so specific. So, um, this paradox has, has, has uh, come to my mind. Next slide, please. And it kind of hooks up with, uh, with what we're trying to, to do here, because I believe that curricular alignment is a form of reuse of content, which is one of the promises of, of, of the open educational resources. It's its openness that let us um, uh, get some uh, content and apply it to another. Um, for example, another country, which has been our case. And, and I think everything starts with granularity. Uh, when you try to match an ed educational resource to a specific learning objective or outcome. So basically, our first approach was a granular one, going after the learning objective and outcome. Uh, our curriculum in Chile has around, in thinking of, uh, of uh, math, uh, in each level, we have around 30 and 40 learning outcomes that we need to achieve. So in that sense, Khan Academy for us is it's our flagship when we try to uh, match the resources with, uh, with the learning outcomes. Um, because, because it's granular, you have this, this very little pieces of uh, which makes it a lot easier so you can build um, and match the learning outcome with, with the resources. And, and, and after you have to review uh, those that learner content, the best way to match it is going to the curricular document. Uh, and you need to review not only the standards that are 
in, in the general statements of, of the curriculum, but you also need to go to the specific uh, curricular documents, such as study programs, uh, assessment exercises, and textbooks, like uh, uh, our colleagues in Honduras did. Next slide, please. So when you select and you try to match, uh, the first thing we, we thought about is that we need interactive content. We wanna build solutions that have content that can be appealing and interesting and, 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 and students can engage in a very active way. And there we have a very strong need for OER, interactive OER in Spanish. We have very few, so this is a call uh, and we need to find the ways that we can have a, a, a more critical mass of, of content where we can you know, take from to align. Um, so what we, our first approach was related to the thematic search. We use the engine in the Calibri Studio in, in a massive way. Um, so that really helped us to go specifically what we're looking for, what, whether it's triangles or percentage or whatever, you can uh, look it with, uh, with, uh, with keywords and, and that really helped us. But one thing I would like to, to, to really emphasize is that first we started to searching within the Khan Academy channel, but then we started to sneak on the other curricular alignments that other people have done uh, with Khan Academy. And that really kind of propelled our, uh, our alignment process, really. So uh, I think this the idea of building a, a, a hub for curricularly aligned resources from the Calibri Studio is a fantastic idea. I think we can really scale and go faster when we look how others have uh, curricularly aligned the resources. And uh, another key topic for us is, is uh, has been to look at, at the way uh, of how uh, curricular uh, documents have uh, have uh, have dealt with uh, with the exercises and because as we, as we are looking for interactive content, exercises is one of the biggest uh, uh, type of resources we have seen. So, Colibri Studio has this very neat uh, feature to you can preview the exercise and then you can compare it to the, to, to the curricular documents. And it, it's like our validation uh, point where say, yeah, okay, yes, this, this type of exercise is what we, we were in. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here. Um, some issues about this, we've had a lot of high, high coverage um, with, with, the, with the results that we have uh, made, but we have a lot of disparity in the quality. So we need to really level up. For example, in math, we have an urgent need related to some um, content dimensions like geometry and statistics, especially in the lower levels. So we need to, uh, we need to level up the quality of our... So I, I'm, I'm already over six minutes, so uh, I'm gonna close here, Shivi. Uh, if there's any question, I'll be very happy to take him on, on the Q&A chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Runner. Really appreciate that. Um, so for our next, uh, our fourth step about leveling, um, transitioning from what Runner was mentioning, um, we have Michael Bell, who will be speaking um, as an assessment specialist and a mathematics educator. Um, his experience with curriculum includes collaborations um, with UNESCO as an assessment specialist and with McGraw-Hill as well. He worked on the Ghanaian curriculum for math, um, and we're excited to hear his recommendations. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever the case may be. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts, the details of alignments. Um, <clears throat> I've been managing alignments uh, at various jobs for longer than I like to think about. Um, most of my background is in assessment, which is why with that first bullet, uh, I mentioned that there are two elements of an alignment. There's the educational standards and there's the curricular activity or a test item. Basically you can do an alignment with any educational activity. We're just focused on curriculum here today. Um, I'm certain that 
everybody on this uh, webinar has taken a look at educational standards and you have seen how they use language, specifically mathematical language, to describe what it is that uh, the students are expected to know, to uh, expected to do. Um, so when you're doing an alignment, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting too far. Curricular activities, such as the OER resources um, that we've been looking at, require students to uh, perform mathematical and or cognitive processes. Those are not usually spelled out as in as much detail and as much specific language as the educational standards because they're not the same, obviously. So that's the part where you or other experts have really got to dig deep into those activities and decide, okay, what are students really doing? If it's something about equations, what are they doing with that equation? Are they just manipulating it to isolate a variable? Are they solving it? What exactly are they doing with that equation? Then the comparison comes in. You have to say, okay, what is that process that students are doing? And then you have to look at the standards to um, decide which one has language that specifically reflects those mathematical and cognitive processes. Sometimes that won't necessarily happen, um, but a lot of times it will. Um, it's something, and if you've never done that before, um, this is basically what it comes down to in, in its most simple form. I could talk for an hour about this easily, but Shivi said I had to keep it within five minutes. Um, Next slide, please. We're going to look at an example. Sometimes, and like I said, it, uh, you, you know, if you're doing this for the first time, it might not come easy. It'll take, uh, it'll take you a little longer as you go along, but eventually, like anything you practice at, you'll get the hang of it. But sometimes, the standards are written in such a way that, oh, maybe it could be one, maybe it could be the other, and that's okay. If you have 10 people look at, look at a particularly troublesome activity, you might get 10 different answers, or at least five. Um, here's one activity. Describe the probability of spinning each color on this spinner. And you can see it's got blue, red, and green. and I used the, uh, I should have specified that these were from the Ghana uh, Junior High School Standards, which is what I worked on for learning equality. Um, and they have two. One is at level two, find the probability of an outcome. One is at level three, find the probability of a given event. And if that's all you had to work from, that might be confusing because, you know, how, how are those defined? You personally might have an idea, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the uh, creators of the Ghana Curricular Standards had in mind. Fortunately, they do give some more uh, information in the document, which is what I had to do. I had to go and look and dig a little deeper. I had to look at the background information. I had to look at the examples that they gave. And what I discovered was that the way Ghana defines it in their syllabus, uh, teaching syllabus, is that an outcome is more related to experimental probability, whereas an event is more closely related to theoretical probability. Since the activity is really based on theoretical probability, 3.43.3 is a better alignment. But you could make an argument for 215.2. It's just that, you know, they're, they both work. It's just that one is better than the other. Um, 
Now, uh, I also forgot to mention, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat and I'll get to them when I can. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is one where, and I'm kind of working backwards here. I started off with how do you do an alignment, getting into the details, giving an example, but this really philosophy is where you should start because I'm not going to, for a moment, think that everybody on this webinar um, is going to be doing curricular alignments for the same exact reason. I imagine they will all be closely related reasons, but philosophy of why you're doing an alignment is really something you have to, um, you really have to decide on your own before you get started. And I, and somebody referenced that and I apologize, I don't remember who it was uh, that was talking about something about this. Um, so one of the qu big questions is, how closely do you have to align these? For example, if you're looking at, at an activity and then you look at the standards and none of the standards quite match it, how important is that? Does that mean you don't teach that activity or use it? I can't answer that. That is incumbent upon each one of you and for those of you who are creating alignments for other people, you have to think about the end user. Um, I'll look at a couple, we'll look at it again. We'll look at a couple examples. Um, Michael, I'm, where it said, I'm sorry to cut you off. I think that um, we'll have to, to move along, but we will be sharing all of these slides. So um, everyone will be able to refer to the examples um, after the session, if that works. Thank you, Shivi. Thank you, apologies. Um, so if we could move on um, to our fifth step so that we can, um, that we can keep things moving um, in a timely fashion. Our next speaker will be Vicki Pendry. Um, she's the CEO of the Curriculum Foundation and she worked with a, tool, uh, a team of um, aligners from around the world. She'll be speaking a little bit more about her experience um, in connecting the alignment to pedagogical uses, um, working with the Ghanaian curriculum in English. Vicki, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Shivi, and good day, everybody. It's, it's very wonderful to be on a call with so many participants. Um, I just wanted to share with you a little bit um, of the thought processes that my team went through as we were selecting various activities and resources to align to the English curriculum. And I think what's very important to highlight is that if we think about the intended curriculum, which is the national curriculum, the standards that are set and agreed by the government, that curriculum and the syllabus related to it then goes through a number of processes. It is planned in various ways by various people. It's delivered in various ways by various people. And eventually the children get to experience the curriculum. And what's important is that we need to consider how we can narrow the gap between what is intended and what is experienced. Thank you, next slide. So a couple of questions to guide our choices of activities and materials to align. What guidance can we take from the curriculum framework? So not just the details of the syllabus itself, but the wider curriculum in terms of its philosophies and principles. In addition, what guidance can we take from the syllabus, the actual um, granular that we've been hearing about in terms of the learning, the intended learning outcome? And then what considerations do we need to make when selecting activities and resources so that the pedagogies reflect the intended um, aims of the overall curriculum? Next slide. So if you'll forgive me using a, a musical analogy midweek, many countries have a national um, anthem. And when we think of a national curriculum, we might consider that a national curriculum has got its own theme tune. And then as we're selecting activities to reflect that curriculum, we need to ensure that the activities and the resources are in tune with, are in harmony with the overall um, intentions of the curriculum. 
At the Curriculum Foundation, we often talk about a framework, and we found that, found that in many countries, when we create a very visual framework, it helps curriculum designers and aligners to consider the effectiveness of any designed activity in terms of how it might support progress towards the intended outcomes of the curriculum. This little picture here you can see is just a snip of the introduction uh, to the English curriculum in Ghana, and that is almost a list of considerations that we need to consider when we're identifying which activities to use. Next slide. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it just illustrates the point. When we think about the rationale for English, we're looking at effective communication skills and we're working to help our learners become members of an international community. That's why we're teaching uh, English. So how does the activity that we're selecting match that rationale? Next slide. If we think about the philosophy that Michael's just been talking about in a, a slightly different context, what language are we using and what, how are we helping learners to develop their learning at their own pace? The learning needs to be rooted in their own experiences, culture and heritage, and that will allow learners to identify with what they're learning and why they're learning. Next slide, please. Here we have the general aims for the English curriculum and you can see there we've got language and literacy, effectiveness, purposeful, imaginative, creative and critical. And when we're selecting activities and resources, we need to see these aims breathing through the activities that we select. Next slide, please. Competencies. Joining together knowledge and understanding, skills, values and attitudes, core competencies in the Ghanaian curriculum need to come to life in any materials that are selected. Thank you. Next slide, please. Here we have the learning domains, the details of what learning outcomes are made of, that knowledge and understanding that we talked about just now in relation to competencies. And importantly, of course, in this case, language skills, although language skills are important across the whole curriculum, and there are the attitudes and values as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of pedagogy, these three items of pedagogy are listed in the introductory pages to the English curriculum for Ghana. And we can hear, see that learner-centered pedagogy. That's probably a phrase that we hear rather often, but I wonder what we all understand by that phrase. And we're going to have a look at some of the details in that in a moment. When we talk about inclusion, that's largely about making sure learning begins where the children are at. So how can we go about finding what children know and understand, and then adapting and selecting materials based on our understanding of what they already know. And that is, of course, supported by differentiated activities and a careful balance of scaffolding so that you're not doing the learning for the child, but you are giving them just the right amount of support to help them to make progress. Next slide, please. So here are just two examples of issues that are so important in relation to pedagogy and the choices that one might make when selecting activities. This idea of a learner-centered curriculum, it's far greater than just selecting activities that we hope the learners might be interested in. It's got to offer them some choice. It's got to offer them a variety of open and closed tasks. And there are further details in that wheel. The little torches on the left are showing that when we're thinking about assessment, we need to make sure that through the activities that we select, there are a variety of opportunities for that's my alarm going. There are a variety of opportunities to assess how well the children are making progress towards the learning outcome through conversations, through observations, and through an interrogation of the products. Next slide. So here's a very simple example of a framework that one might adopt. And this is what my team created when we were looking at the curriculum for Ghana. We thought in depth and detail about the subject itself. We looked at the curriculum the wider curriculum to find the philosophy and values that we've just looked at. We explored the student competencies and we hope to see those in the activities we selected. And of course, we were hoping that any activity was rooted as far as possible in the culture and heritage of Ghana. And when those work together, we can reach the intended aims of the English curriculum. So finally, just one um, cheery example for you on the next slide. 
a very simple activity, which flower is the most beautiful? We imagine the language, the communication, the cooperation, the, uh, the language of uh, the literacy levels, the choice of vocabulary, and we can see that that activity is rooted in the culture and heritage because the flowers are native. We can see the development of student competencies, we can see values being created, and of course we can see the subject being developed. So, in summary, as we're selecting and aligning materials to support the wider aims of the curriculum is really important to not only look at the individual specifics of the learning outcomes within the standards, but to put those specific outcomes within the wider context of the curriculum, so that as we're selecting activities, we're enabling our learners to experience the curriculum that was intended for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, for the last uh, speaker in our set of panelists today, um, I welcome Wanjira Kinuthia. She's based in Kenya. She's a learning designer. And um, she was actually the first subject matter expert who worked with our learning equality and UNHCR collaboration um, two years ago to align the Kenyan curriculum in several subjects. So since it's been a while since she's done her alignment, she'll be talking about the process of how she filled in gaps um, using uh, some of the tools that are available, as well as looking for other resources to supplement. Um, and in that way, emphasizing that alignment is a process that is never complete, but requires sharing and iterating. So Wanjira, over to you. Thank you, Shivi. Um, so as Shivi mentioned, I did this in 2018, but um, as again, as she mentioned, this is ongoing. So I'm always finding things and wanting to go back and make sure that I can fill in the gaps or if not that share what we found. But generally when I went through the process, um, I used a four step approach. Uh, so some of what I'll mention, you probably already had, but I, my approach was slightly different depending on what was available. So the first thing I always did was I reviewed the materials for each in, in the channels in Colibri which was already available. And to, to do that, it was important because I needed a starting point. I needed to know what's there and what I need to use in order to fill in the curricular gaps. So, and having said that, uh, the subjects I worked with were in mathematics, uh, the STEM subjects, and then also uh, life skills was another one. And this was for form one and two in the Kenyan education system. But I, I wanna mention that we are actually in a process of transition to uh, uh, CBC curriculum. So that's been a slight change and that of course affects how we continue to engage the resources that we locate. So in, in particular for those subjects, it was quite easy for some of them, but I'll mention the one that was a little bit different because of the kind of uh, very contextualized information that we needed to find. So for mathematics, for biology, science and physics, those were fairly um, universal in their approach. What varied sometimes was the usage or the examples or the idea of how some of these illustrations would come across to the students in Kenya and to also make sure that they are in line with what the Kenyan curriculum, which is a KICD, Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development is putting a, a, alongside. Something else I want to mention is the way um, the KICD curriculum is structured in some, on some levels, we have a high level uh, of the objective. So you know what you're going to teach as a teacher. But then you get to some subjects where it's very granular. And this is where the challenge, or if I may call it that, would appear because as it gets more specific into the Kenyan uh, context, then it becomes sometimes more difficult to find a resource. So for what I did for that was then I would go into KICD and search for resources using the metadata and the descriptions within the studio. If I didn't find that, I would go through uh, the other portals which are already connected to Colibri. Uh, some of the examples they have are Khan Academy and CK12 and some of the others that have been mentioned uh, today. So if that was not available, then I went through the Colibri studio with the exact title of what I found in the external portal and bring it in. And in such situations, what I did, then I would uh, use the URL and then create a spreadsheet, which I then shared back with uh, learning equality so that that could be added on at a later point. And then in terms of making sure that we even got even to a further details, I did a further search to perform very, very targeted searches in other repositories, for example, uh, Google, uh, and sometimes even YouTube, but always making sure to check to see what license uh, what they were credited to. So in most cases, I really had to see if there was anything that was 
free to use, share, or modify. So those were the criteria and the four steps that I used to select the OER content. Uh, content. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. So this is uh, a little bit more of an illustration of the process. Uh, uh, one back, please. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, a little bit more detailed um, explanation of, of how we did this on my side was you search in broad terms and then you keep refining the keywords. So if, for example, some subjects were fairly easy because the word geometry reflects in most subjects and in most uh, languages and we're able to do that. In some contexts, we were not able to do that because we might be using a, a, a different description in, in Kenya, for example. So that meant again, going through the cycle and ensuring that whatever was not identified was put in the spreadsheet. And then if there was no resource, that's where I made the mark. Uh, and I made a point to say that for this uh, learning objective, there was nothing uh, available. So that again, leaves space for, can somebody develop this and make it accessible and available to others? So finally, everything that I was able to find, I then entered into the Colibri system. And that I'm sure at this point, most of those have already been uploaded um, by the learning equality team uh, for some of the ones that we were able to find after. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of a spreadsheet. Uh, alone. Uh, I had multiple tabs just going through each level, but as you can see, they have the main topic and then I have a topic, subtopic, a resource name, um, the source, the video, uh, whether it's a video, the type, and then the URL. So this was very specific and it was very, very useful for us to then be able to say, let me click on this and see if it's still available and how can it be imported back into Colibri. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, but before I finish, uh, before I say what um, the teachers have shared with me, I just want to emphasize something. How do you know when you're done? Me having gone through the four steps was the first thing. If I've gone through all the four steps, it means I have at that moment in time exhausted what's readily available, which means that the space for things that don't already exist to be pulled in at a later time when they're developed. The second thing to look for was, when you have a resource and it has multiple um, learning objectives and learning outcomes that it can address, has it been used in multiple resources? And having done that, you can then point out. So for example, it's a video. A video might be 10, 15 minutes. What portion of a video can you use for one uh, objective and what other portion can you use for another objective? So again, have you exhausted the full use of that particular resource? Something else we're looking for in, is the balance. And by balance, I mean, um, the types. So there's many different resources and many different types that we can uh, tap into, for example, videos, interactive simulations, PDF documents, because again, we have to keep in mind that sometimes the bandwidth might be a challenge in some situations. So when we have that kind of balance, I think it's important to do that. And in, in terms of also thinking about how many times and how many resources you've used uh, for one particular lesson, you also want to think of the balance in terms of if you have one math lesson, but only one resource, is that the same as one lesson, but with five resources? So you have to also think through in terms of what does your actual curriculum re require you to have so that again, you're not overwhelming either the teacher or the students when they're coming to use that particular resource. And I just wanna finish off with uh, this uh, nice quote. It's actually, uh, it had very happenstance. Uh, I just happened to, here some teachers here in Kenya who were recently introduced to Colibri just in the last two, two months uh, since schools have reopened. And in one of the schools that I've visited on a very different mission, so to say, this is something I had and I was very excited to hear that they have been trained in Colibri and the excitement that they have and the fact that they don't have to uh, create their own resources. And as we've said, 2020 opened up many opportunities for how we think about teaching and learning so those who had not been previously engaged in e-learning and distance learning have really found a new way of thinking about e-resources and also to think about the complexities that they thought were there can ne don't necessarily have to block what they want to do. So this particular teacher says, there's so many things I can use. I don't have the time or the resource to create it, but this is something that's readily available. And especially for some particular topics and some particular um, grade levels that has worked out fantastically in some areas where the challenges exist, such as access to uh, technology and even very, very basic things that we, we sometimes think about as uh, how do we get children to learn in comfortable situations. So thank you, Shivi, and thank you, everyone.
Thank you very much to Anjira and to all of our panelists for um, going over this process. And as you can see, everyone really engaged in all of the steps of the process, but we hope that diving a little bit into each of them um, helped give greater clarity on what was actually involved. Now, zooming out a little bit to the ecosystem level ramifications of this, I'd like to turn it back over to my colleague Taskeen from the EdTech Hub to discuss a systematic approach to curriculum alignment that we've proposed. Thank you, Taskeen. Thank you so much, Shivi. So I'll jump straight in onto the first slide. So EdTech Hub's learnings on curriculum, uh, curriculum alignment have stemmed from our work in various countries, namely in Kenya, Tanzania, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And in all of these countries, there's been some sort of interest from the Ministry of Education in terms of remote learning or virtual in learning environments, especially in light of uh, COVID-19. Um, thus, we've had these similar, similar requests for supports on these topics, um, for example, to digitize the curriculum, and then this has stemmed into more interest in the theme of curriculum alignment. Now, in some parts of our other work, work, when we've been engaging with various government counterparts or funders or NGOs, we've also noticed that be, there's been overlapping attempts to unpack curriculum alignment, and that these efforts have largely happened in silos. Um, so resulting from this, we, we're beginning to see a lot of duplication of efforts and resources around the topics uh, that could better be resolved through a coordinated efforts or knowledge sharing between various initiatives. So on to the next slide. Um, we, we've already heard about the finer details regarding the curriculum alignment process from our subject matter experts. And here I'd like to outline some of the higher level challenges. So on the top uh, left, it's, it's from the educator's perspective. And here, educators spend large amounts of time uh, doing curriculum alignment that then often stays on their personal computers or is maybe shared with a small group of colleagues. And then much of this, this work is often quite time consuming and it's un often unpaid. Now on the bottom left are initiatives that try to do curriculum alignment on mass. So this could be uh, crowdsourcing metadata through tagging or using automated alignment um, through machine learning. Now, while these could be effective, they also may lead to inaccurate or inconsistent tagging. And with algorithms, they might not be able to detect the different pedagogical uses that we've heard about today um, and the alternative rele relevance of content. Now on the right, um, other issues include siloed efforts by content curators that then don't actually get the official accreditation by curricular bodies. There's also decentralized and uncoordinated efforts that, don't, that then don't um, propagate across the rest of the system. And lastly, there's an overwhelming amount of new OER that's uh, created that then needs to be realigned to existing resources. So onto the next slide. Uh, what would a curriculum alignment hub address? So over the past few months, EdTech Hub and Learning Equality have been working together on a concept note for a proposed curriculum alignment hub where various stakeholders can come together. So uh, this initiative would basically address or, or try to reduce the duplication of efforts and work to strengthen coordination between different organizations. Um, it would also provide a space for, for learning from each other and building on each other's learnings. It would help to increase the, discoverage, the, the discoverability of alignment materials and already aligned resources. It would help to share effective practices and technical expertise. Um, and it would help to wor work towards measures of quality assurance and standardization. So on the next slide, um, we, we've outlined um, four critical components of this collab collaborative effort, and this has stemmed from experiences and challenges over the past few years. So the first component is a dynamically updated tracker, and this would track alignment efforts according to, to curriculums and content sources. The second component would be a database of professionals such as subject matter experts that are qualified to align curriculum materials. The third component would be an announcement area for sharing ideas and initiatives. And the fourth component would be a host, a host of diverse, a sort of diverse kit of training resources featuring effective practices uh, or downloadable and interoperable templates for sharing and other onboarding tools. So lastly, who is this curriculum alignment hub for and who should join? 
So the initiative is aimed at educators, curriculum designers, content creators, ministries of education, donors, um, nonprofits and NGOs working in the curriculum alignment space, ed tech and platform creators, and also potential curriculum alignment consultants. So currently we are looking for organizations to shape and spearhead this initiative. And if you're interested, you can contact myself or Shivi to get involved at that level. Um, we have also have a concept note of this proposed um, uh, curriculum alignment hub, and we can pop that in the chat for you. Um, and we've kept this in a Google Doc uh, form, so you can comment and suggest and adapt it as you wish. So that's my whistle-stop tour of curriculum alignment hub done, and I'll hand over back to Shavi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tuskeen. Um, it's great food for thought, and um, this is definitely something that EdTech Hub and Learning Equality observed the need for um, after we saw the urge to collaborate together um, among the subject matter experts who are speaking with us today, as well as um, the great interest that we have from the general public in this subject, um, as evidenced by all of you here. So to start um, off, speaking a little bit about some of the questions that you have. Um, we'll now be going into our period of question and answer. Feel free to ask questions um, in the specific question and answer space or on Menti, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so to begin, we had a question for our subject matter experts in general um, about if there's anything that governments, nonprofits, um, content creators, implementers could do to make this process easy for you, um, easier than it, than it had been, um, what would that be? And who do you think would be best positioned to do that? And uh, Maxie, I'd love to invite you to answer that. Thank you very much, Shivi, and thank you to all the panelists for sharing your wonderful presentations. Um, two points that I wanna to touch in relation to that question. The first being um, for content creators to kind of outline a path for how OERs may be able to be modified and contextualized to particular contexts. So if, if there are abilities to do that, whether it means um, you know, changing some of the language to be more culturally connected or even um, able to provide recommendations in terms of um, modifying some content to fit better for particular contexts. So outlining that path and making sure that's very clear for those that are doing this alignment process would be incredibly helpful. And because there's such great content, we want to make sure that's available widely to everyone. And then the other point I would note on is kind of more of like a ministry uh, oriented thing that would have would be helpful in future efforts is to consider how educators and those on the ground are directly involved in those conversations and processes of alignment. I found it really illustrative to um, get this feedback working with teachers who are currently in classrooms as to um, what would or would not work in their context in terms of alignment. And that's why we opted for aligning to the curriculum books as opposed to the formal standards, because that was the feedback of what would actually be used in the classroom. So just kind of a overall recommendation to make sure that different actors are at the table in those conversations. So I will stop there and pass it off to someone else. Shivi? Thank you. Yes, um, Bernard, did you have something to add about that um, question? Yes, I wanted to compliment uh, in, in this wish uh, to ask for, for, for ministries. And I think a very key issue so we can make this curriculum alignment process a lot more easier is to, to consider technical open standards. We need content where we need to find content where we can build, you know, build it up in the in the Colibri studio, but we need to we need to make paths so we can collect that content and and and, and be able to to flexibly use it. And I think a key issue there is to have open standards so we can so those resources that are built can be reused in any type of different context. So uh, this doesn't happen always because when ministries, you know, buy and acquire, uh, they don't put the clause of that, that, that those resources need to be in an open standard. That could also help us to, 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 to feed uh, content where we have scarcity. Uh, today, we don't have all the content we need. So we need to import that content into the Colibri Studio 
So in for that process, we need to open technical standards to do so. Thank you. Fantastic. So those are two um, recommendations for content creators and also for those who, um, who work with standards as well. Um, another question that we received in the chat, um, which is uh, of great interest to us at Learning Equality and I think to each of the panelists making their own unique judgments about this as well, is uh, from Maria Bibi. Um, should some alignment work be left for the teacher or should everything be done for the teacher? So a question about how much alignment should come into the process of lesson planning for the teacher. Eager to hear from all of you on that. Um, and I'll turn this one over first to Vicky, if you'd like to speak about this. Hi, thank you. That's a really important uh, question because developing a teacher's agency and uh, giving them the opportunity to, um, you know, make a valuable contribution to the shape and creation of learning is, is really important in developing the capacities of our teachers. I think there's a really careful balance to be had when um, activities are designed and created so that there's just the right support for the teachers within the activity itself, but the activity is either clearly aligned to the teacher or to the child. Sometimes the resources we were looking at, we weren't quite sure whether the resource was kind of just go straight to the child or it was for the teacher to adapt and implement. So I think particularly for resources that are for younger learners, where we don't want to see too many words <laughs> for, for young children to read, the sort of supporting materials for teachers to help them um, have some influence on the way that activity is uh, implemented is really, really important. That's fantastic, Vicky. Um, and I'd also like to ask um, Wanjira if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit to this as well. I know that you've observed specifically the lesson planning for a lot of different um, teachers when they were actually using the channel in, uh, in Kenya. So really curious about your insights as well. Yeah, thank you, um, Shibi. So I, th I think of it uh, in two ways. One is uh, you want to leave room for creativity and also room for exploration and innovation. So from that point of view, I could see why it would be important to have um, teachers also learn how to create them because then you also develop that. I think somebody mentioned about the philosophy of why we do this. So you start to gradually build in that philosophy into the work that they do. But in certain circumstances, it's a bit more difficult because there's very little to start with and you have to go through the training process. So you get them started using what already exists. And then as you move through, you do part of the training being how you can already incorporate what's there and how you can customize it and also make it much more appropriate for your class. And as I mentioned with the instance that I uh, experienced just a couple of weeks ago, that was part of what they were doing is encouraging them to develop and then use. In this particular instance, they were just doing that within the school. But then I think that's where you start to then say, this is now being created for the larger community, not just specifically within the school. Thank you, Vanjira. I really appreciate that. Um, another question that we had comes um, from our mentee, and it's specifically about um, going through the different steps of this process. Did you, um, did you all find that you engaged in separate steps in this manner, or did you find that each of them contained um, many processes? or um, only a few of them were especially critical for your work. Um, really interested to see how all of you adapted the process uh, for your own, um, your own needs with the curriculum. And um, to, to answer this one, I would love to hear from someone who worked with it individually as well as in a group. So um, as to individually, Michael, would you, would you mind um, speaking to this first? Um... Sure. I, you know, I've been doing this so long that so much of this, I mean, it's, as I was watching all those presentations, I was thinking, well, yes, I do that, but it's been, I, I've been doing it so long, it's just internalized for me. And it really made me think back to when I first really started learning the process of alignment. And again, that was, you know, for test items, which are much more granular. And that is one thing I also wanted to uh, call back to was Werner's thing about the importance of granularity. Um, that's not always going to happen in curricular activities. Sometimes you'll met, have an activity that blends a couple of standards, um, which can, you know, throw things off. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wish I could, I wish I could have a better answer um, for you, Shivi, but it's, 
I think it goes back to what I said. It's like, you know, you, you learn all the important parts, learn the process, you go through it, you go through it again, it starts to come natural. And before you knew it, it's just almost automatic. Um, kind of like, I, I don't know how many people out there are teachers. Um, you probably weren't perfect your first day or week of teaching but eventually you got to the point where you're good at it. That's great, Michael, thank you. And it's, um, it's a really good reminder that some of these processes and in alignment in particular, one thing that we often hear is that it feels like something that people are already doing. And we really hope that you were also able to see some of your work as attendees in this process and just connect it to other questions that people are answering in the space. Um, with regards to this question, I also wanted to ask Dr. Mania if you wouldn't mind um, commenting on this as well. I know that you worked with a very large team of others who were working in the process, so would really be interested, um, especially your perspective in um, advising others who are working on coordinating an alignment process with a large group of people, which is something that Maxi and, and Vicky and uh, Werner also did as well. Thank you, Chippy. Um, actually, working with uh, a big team, as you mentioned, was not easy, uh, but we uh, divided the uh, team based on their specialization and based on the subject. And at the same time, uh, what we did in order to coordinate the whole work, we, uh, we believed that induction course is very important for uh, the, uh, all uh, the team members in order to distinguish between what is meant by alignment, a content, and mapping a content. When we uh, talked with the team about aligning uh, the content, we specifically worked on aligning the uh, outcomes of this subject with uh, Colibri uh, digital uh, content. Uh, this was the first stage where they have to match and align the uh, outcomes in uh, the framework of each subject with the content available on Colibri Studio. Uh, and the second step, we moved to the mapping of the content where we tried to map uh, the uh, content with the topics and lessons inside the textbooks. So this will uh, be easier for the teachers to select the content based on topics or based on the uh, outcomes. And this, of course, will give a, a room or a space for our teachers to have a, a bigger or alternative uh, space in the implementation uh, process, whether they would like to depend on using the content as enrichment or supplementary uh, resource uh, to fulfill uh, the uh, outcomes and to be achieved within the lesson, or if they want to use it in order to explain and clarify a specific topic uh, within a specific lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mania. Um, so with that, um, I think we're about coming to the end of our question and answer period. But I'd love to ask um, all of you, the panelists, um, if you have any concluding thoughts, um, especially upon listening to each other, many of you for the first time, it would be great to hear uh, two or three sentences of reflection from each of you. Um, so I'll begin with, uh, with Werner and uh, eager to hear um, what you have to say. Well, in, in, in this uh, idea of, um, of reusing uh, different content for different types of, uh, uh, of, uh, of learning contexts. Um, I would like to, to emphasize the, the idea that uh, you can stumble with uh, some difficulties uh, because when we talk about uh, standards, um, there's not just one standard you have to hook up to. Um, um, and, and, and we had a lot of problems related to, to different types of uh, objectives and outcomes. Uh, some objectives are, are very much broader, or you have these objectives that try to integrate other objectives. Uh, 
also trim. So th there you have to, you, you really have to map out what you want to achieve. And, and the other thing is that um, you also can, can confront a lot of objectives related to a local specific. So, so for example, if you're working with money, uh, you need a resource with the local money, not with the external one. So it can be more meaningful and powerful. So um, just wanted to say that if you can stumble with those difficulties, you just have to go, just keep on and, and, and try to, to better align the best way you can. Thank you. Thank you, Runner. It's a great reflection on um, the importance of alignment in finding the places where localization needs to happen. Um, Maxi, in line with this, uh, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. Um, I think it's really powerful to be able to reflect on the way that this is happening internationally. And I think with the um, pandemic, we have been able to see challenges in the ways in which they have been heightened for educational access in certain areas and to be able to share across spaces, both resources as well as lived experiences um, is really able to help us move forward in, in addressing this equity and, and um, access for, for all children. And so I think just overall reflections on this process is how grateful um, the teachers that I worked with were to be considered in this and to see that organizations like Learning Equality and UNHCR and uh, Tech Hub are creating these resources to address the real challenges that they are having in the field and to know that they're not kind of left alone is such an important um, piece to take away from this. So thank you. Thank you very much, Maxi. Um, that's really wonderful to hear. Um, and Michael, for, for you, any wrap up thoughts? Um, I just want to reiterate that um, we have, uh, I, I don't know who all is on this panel and what everybody's job is, but I imagine we have a wide range of people in different educational positions. And so when you're doing an alignment, the most important, I, I, I want to come back to the most important thing is the purpose of it. What are you doing this alignment for? What are you trying to get out of it? And once you have that, that will help you move forward um, no matter what method you're using, but it's, it's, it's kind of like, why do we teach? So why do we do this alignment? Um, I, wish I, I wish I had something more profound to share, but thank you, Shivi. Thank you, Michael. It's always great to be able to consider um, the users as well as the purpose of what the alignment is for. Um, Vicky, how about you? Any concluding thoughts? Thank you. Just a couple of issues. One in relation to what Michael's just said, actually. I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, learners are educated at school and in classrooms, but they're also learning far beyond the school and classrooms. And I think any activities that can link learning to the real world and uh, to authentic experiences is really, really valuable. And that helps for teacher motivation um, as well as learner motivation. A couple of people in the chat are asking about um, the complexities of making materials culturally relevant and rather like I was saying before about designing activities so they've just got the right amount of support for the teacher equally activities can be designed so that they've just got an opportunity for the teacher to link the local to whatever the activity might be and, and I think um, the work we're doing in South Sudan we have 64 national languages so we're very aware of that challenge and the, 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 the skill in designing activities which allows teachers and different communities from a range of contexts to just connect that um, activity, often with a really, really good inquiry question to the local experiences is very effective in um, uh, making progress towards quality education. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Um, and definitely in line with adapting for cultural relevance in particular. Um, Dr. Mania, thank you for being here with us. Would you like to share um, any last thoughts from your experience with doing that? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, um, I believe that learning is a journey and uh, having such a hub with, uh, is a great initiative since it contains uh, a lot of resources 
which will enhance the students' skills and empower the teachers with different resources, especially the resources uh, in, uh, the, in Colibri Studio and in this uh, hub uh, are uh, so various and different in terms of being interactive, containing uh, simulations, even articles. So uh, by providing students with different resources, we are uh, pushing toward having a qualitative education and we uh, uh, enhance uh, the students and empower them to uh, master their learning uh, via uh, exploring uh, these resources. Uh, on the other hand, I'd like to add something. Um, we have very limited resources in Arabic language. So maybe this will be a request for content creators if uh, uh, they can work more on, develop uh, on developing more interactive Arabic resources on specific topics because we uh, mainly have main topics and main standards that are taught in all the countries despite the differences. So uh, specifically the scientific topics, they are the same and the language will not be a, bar a barrier. So uh, we can consider it a call for the content developer if they can enrich the Arabic content with interactive uh, material and interactive resources. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mania. And uh, finally, Wanjira, we'll turn it over to you, our last um, panelist and our first subject matter expert um, to give your reflections before turning it over to conclude. Uh, thank you again, Shibi. Uh, so mine, I think some of my thoughts have already been mentioned, but one thing I wanna add is that um, I think of this as a collective collaborative process. So I think, even as I was going through the process and even going through this presentation, I kept using the word we. And the reason I do that is because I know I cannot be an expert in everything. So I also rely on others who know a little bit more about me on certain subjects. So for example, uh, mathematics or something that I haven't covered in many years in biology. So this is where we tap into each other's knowledge, our resources, our, our uh, areas of, of knowledge. And this is what builds the the resources. And I'm sure from when I finished mapping in 20, uh, 2018 to now, I'm sure there's a lot more uh, that has been added on to the individual uh, portals and also to Colibri. So it's an ongoing process, but it has to be collective. And we have to think of what each one of us is able to contribute. And if you're not contributing, what are we able to revise? And that's, again, part of the learning process. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Manjira. Um, is, this was such an exciting session today. And um, on behalf of all of the organizers, my name is Lauren, really excited to close this out here. There's been so much great discussion, a lot of exciting um, follow-up information that we'll be sharing in an email, as well as a place for you to continue answering those questions and, and to get um, new answers um, to them to contribute on. So just a few quick calls for action, because as you can tell, this is such a nuanced set of actors um, that, uh, we can consider when conducting curriculum alignment and to echo what Wanjira said that we is so critical. Um, so for those who are interested in learning more, building on today's presentations, we're going to be sharing a curriculum alignment explainer in the coming weeks as a standalone course on this process. Um, we know that many of you actually implement ed tech programs. So just a quick reminder that you should recruit and reserve time in implementation for the alignment process. And this explainer will help to support you. For content creators, we know that you play an incredibly important role in exposing vocabulary, learning activities, and more in easily browsable ways to those performing alignment. So we encourage you to consider guides for ministries, openly license your work, or add permissions specifically for the, the process of alignment. For those wanting to take collective action, uh, please join us in the efforts towards establishing a curriculum alignment hub. We'll be sharing a link to the concept note for you to add in your thoughts and, and please join in to help us take this forward. For governments uh, contributing up to date, appropriately digital, um, digitized curriculum standards is very helpful, particularly for alignment. 
And based on today's discussion, taking a closer look at the approval process for use of supplemental materials could ultimately lead to more relevant materials being used in the classroom. So that one act of sharing your digitized curriculum could have really significant value. And lastly, for machine learning folks, um, we're working to working towards building a set of tools to support automating this alignment process and we could use your support. So um, in developing some machine learning algorithms. So please be in touch. Um, so I wanted to conclude, I realize we're a few minutes over. Thank you so much to all of you. I realize 90 minutes is a lot of time to take out of your day, but curriculum alignment really relies on collaboration and learning from others, um, working with subject matter experts, national bodies and educators. And we hope that you'll take the knowledge that you've learned here today and um, embed it into the processes when, when you work. So thank you so much for your time and we look forward to being in touch again soon.